coming up next on Primary Focus. As a nine-year-old girl, I didn't know what to do, what I had to do. Laying down like on the bed, you know. Mental, physical, spiritual, and even sexual abuse. When I went to the residential school, we could not speak our language or they'll hit us. Hurt by the people who were supposed to be caring for them. All in an effort to civilize the savages. When you remove a person's identity, then come the social problems. And those social problems are passed on from one generation to the next, so you kind of have a, a domino effect, and that's where you get today. They destroy generations of children. But is anything being done? I mean, how devastating can it be for a little girl? A little, beautiful, Aboriginal girl. I'm Cal Bramer. Today we look at mental, physical, spiritual, and sexual abuse. Violations committed against a community's most precious commodity, its children. But what happens when the very people who are caring for the children are committing the crime? What happens when these educators claim to be people of God? And what happens when these schools are sponsored by the state? Those are exactly the questions the Canadian government, the church, and a nation of people are asking. Today we get a glimpse of Canada's not so pretty history of Indian residential schools where Canada's Aboriginal or Native children were forced to assimilate to the white man's ways. Amanda Flowers reports. 51-year-old Joyce Tapaquan may now be blind, but she has seen pain and the memories are a nightmare. There was no talking. It was basically like physical like touching and stuff and physical or whatever. As I go back into the dormitory, seeing other girls being taken from their bed and bringing those girls to that room where there was a man. I remember the nights that I felt lonely as a child and wondering if oh, I'll ever see my mother again. As a child, I was depressed. I felt alone and I felt I was scared, I was afraid of those people that were there. And I remember the, the nights were the, the, the nights were the, the bad, the bad times where you wonder as a child, when is it my turn for somebody to come and pick me up and go to that room. It sounds like a nightmare, but it wasn't. At nine years old, it was Joyce Tabaquan's daily reality. Growing up on an Indian reserve in Saskatchewan, Canada, Joyce was ripped away from the only life she knew and placed into Canada's Indian residential school system when her mother was hospitalized with tuberculosis. I started to think nobody cared about me that I needed to be in this place where there was um, people dressed in black with white veils and, you know, crosses on their chest and stuff, and that uh, kind of uh, scared me. The moment she was taken from her home, her world changed forever. I had long hair, but then they took, like, they took a bowl and put it on my head, and then they, like, gave me a, a, a haircut. Hair wasn't the only thing to be cut. Commissioned by the Anglican, United, Presbyterian, and Roman Catholic churches, and the Canadian government, residential school workers severed the children's ties to their native heritage. The children were called savages, and residential schools were created to civilize them. We were not to speak our language, which I speak Soto. I'm a Soto woman, and also I speak Cree. And very lucky to speak two languages. But in school, when, we went, when I went to the residential school, we could not speak our language or they'll hit us. 
The English language Joyce heard was foreign to her, and so were her surroundings. Well, I didn't know what confession was, so when I go to confession, I basically had to admit that I did something that I didn't do. Like, for example, like the person like would say, did you steal a pencil? And I would respond by saying yes. So at that time, they tell me to go back to the pews, but I never knew what pews were, was to go back and say, five Hail Marys and that God would forgive me for stealing. Forced to participate in religious rituals they didn't understand, and beaten if they spoke the only language they knew, Joyce and generations of Aboriginal children suffered spiritual, mental, physical, and sexual abuse at the hands of their caregivers. We used to all be naked in the shower room. I remember when they used to, you know, slap me in, a, a, in my butt and, you know, and then, like, tickle me and, and you know, kiss me in her lips. To survive, Joyce did the only thing she could. She stopped living and merely existed. I was scared to touch, I was scared to feel, I was scared to think, because I thought God would punish me. For five years, Joyce remained in a residential school, beaten and abused. How devastating can it be for a little girl? For a little, beautiful, Aboriginal girl? Why, why, why? Why? Canadian residential schools operated for more than 150 years. The last one closed in 1984. Joyce Tapaquan and thousands like her were abused and left to deal with their pain alone. Many of these demoralized children grew up to be dysfunctional adults. When we come back, a way of life destroyed, communities in trouble, and a government desperate to find a solution. Coming up next. When I experienced sexual abuse at the residential school, it continued, my life continued to be turmoil and dysfunctional even after I left her. Joyce Tapaquan and generations of native Canadian children were ripped from their homeland and taken from their families so that the new European establishment could teach these so-called little savages civilized ways. But in an effort to civilize, residential schools actually created generations of dysfunctional people struggling to survive. We continue our story. I remember as a, a kid, always overdressing, overdressing, two pairs of socks, two pants, tie around my jogging pants, tight, tight, so nobody will, nobody will ever get in my pants. Joyce Tapaquan spent five of the most formative years of her life in a residential school. By submitting to abuse, she believed her caregivers would love her. As a child, you're searching for somebody to care for you and you're searching for somebody to, to love you and so you just do it. You just do what you have to do. The residential school warped Joyce's understanding of love. So when she left, friends and family members continued to abuse her. To dull the pain, she turned to alcohol. I was dealing with internally all that pain, all that hate, all that anger, all that violence, all that abuse, that the sexual part of the abuse, the, everything that I was carrying, tons and tons of garbage. I was so overloaded, I didn't know what to do with it. I didn't know what to do with it but drink to cover it up. Joyce isn't alone. While statistics are hard to find, the Aboriginal Healing Foundation estimates that alcoholism among Aboriginals is six times the national average. Unemployment on reserves is 29%. The infant mortality rate is twice the average, and the suicide rate is three to four times higher than the rest of the population. 
one of the things that really bothered me when I was a kid in Toronto is that when I went into the museum, the statues of Aboriginal people were kept in glass cases. And it always gave me the sense that they were extinct, that they didn't belong here anymore. Expert on Aboriginal affairs Martin Dunn blames these high statistics on one thing. Aboriginal youth are committing suicide because they have no hope above being Aboriginal. Aboriginal people today are not free to be who they are. They're free to be white, they're free to, to, to uh, be Canadians even up to some point, but they're not free to experience their lives as Indigenous people with an Indigenous relationship to their environment and, and what happens in their, in their communities. Having Native roots himself, Martin Dunn has committed his life's work to fight for Aboriginal peoples. He says while they may be struggling with social issues, it's the white man's fault. The most common stereotype is that somehow Aboriginal people, Indigenous people, are primitive, that they're savage, um, and nothing could be further from the truth. The people that were here prior to European contact had a very elegant lifestyle, by and large, very spiritual lifestyle, uh, one that was very satisfying to the people of, of each respective community. In fact, in, in a political and sophisticated sense, it was far more sophisticated than the Europeans in iron suits that were coming over here chopping people's hands off for stealing bread. That's savage. Dunn says Canadians need to stop seeing Aboriginal peoples as historical figures and realize they are a very large, vital population of Canada today. In my early 20s, somehow I had gotten the impression Aboriginal people were extinct. Real Indians didn't exist anymore. That the guy with, with feathers jumping around to the beat of a drum had, had somehow uh, faded into history. The vanishing American is the way it's most often expressed in the States. And over the last 30 years, I found out how false that is. <laughs> the Aboriginal population is growing at three times the rate of non-Aboriginal Canadians. Martin Dunn says it's time that the government wakes up to this reality. What they do is throw tons and tons of money at any example of depravity, uh, alcoholism being a most common one, a family abuse uh, being another, the whole residential school system and the, the impact of that. And what they say is, we resolve our uh, responsibilities towards Aboriginal people in this country by uh, throwing money at these quote unquote problems. We do spend a, a certain amount of money uh, on First Nations in terms of uh, trying to address some of the problems, of course. But those solutions also have to come from First Nations communities. Canadian Aboriginal Affairs spokesman Trevor Souter says the Canadian government of today recognizes the pain residential schools have caused and the trouble they've created for Canada. They would have the ability to visit their parents one day a year, usually Christmas. Uh, so you have a whole generation of people that are lacking the parenting skills that they, and the loving and nurturing that the family environment uh, could have provided them. Uh, a lot of these children uh, lost their identity. They weren't uh, allowed to speak their, their Aboriginal tongue. Uh, their culture, spirituality is instrumental to their identity. Uh, when you remove a person's identity, uh, then come the social problems. On a national level, Trevor Souter says the Canadian government is taking steps to heal the broken relationship between the European Parliament and the nation's Indigenous people. The Government of Canada, uh, 1998, January 7th, issued a statement of reconciliation in which it recognized its poor treatment of Aboriginal people. And among the treatment that was identified was the Indian residential school system. So we're, we're coming to terms with our past. We have to come to terms with our past in order to move on to the future. They may have issued a statement, but Dunn doesn't believe the Canadian government's efforts are helping. The idea the government has is a conflict management regime which says, okay, the law says we have to recognize such, some claims, but let's minimize that as much as we possibly can. They don't say, oh, that, that gives us a vehicle by which we can readjust the terms of coexistence between our two sets of cultures. That doesn't happen and hasn't happened, and as near as I can tell, isn't going to happen. Government is not in the business of accommodating Aboriginal people. It's in the business of confining Aboriginal people. Well, the Canadian government works to repair its relationship with Native people, individuals are left to repair their wounded spirits. Stay with us. All my life, I made people happy, not realizing that Joyce was the one that needed to experience happiness.
Joyce Tapaquan went looking for help. Where she turns just might surprise you. She ended up at the very institution that once abused her. We conclude our story. They used to call me savage. And they used to call me, I was a paganist. And they, said, and they used to say that God would punish me. And actually those people that worked there said, I'm not supposed to tell any of this stuff. Joyce's childhood was a nightmare, and her young adult life wasn't any better. She was an alcoholic, a single mother raising four children on her own, and ultimately, untreated diabetes left her blind. Joyce was angry, and rightly so. I was very angry with this God stuff, you know, and I was angry, very angry. There's a lot of confusion uh, as I was, like, wondering about God, because, well, I mean, if this was a loving God, why would these things happen to me? Tough questions to ask and even harder to answer, but that didn't stop Joyce from looking, and her search ended up taking her back to the institution that once abused her, the church. Welcome to Indian Lady Christian Fellowship for Suit and Bennett today. Good to see you all. They used to have Bible lessons. So I started to go for those. We used to talk about similarities about the culture and about the uh, Bible. But anyone who denies this about Jesus does not have the spirit from God. Indian Maity Christian have. Fellowship Director, Bert Adama. We're here to help people to experience forgiveness and healing that the Creator, the Triune Creator, Father, the Son, Holy Spirit gives us through His Son, Jesus Christ. What we like to say is that people should claim the gifts they've been given by the Creator. Claim them, develop them, share them, and celebrate them. I get all angry and not come back and deal with the situation. But here, like, the good thing I learned is to come and talk about it. It's taken years of counseling and prayer to work through her own issues. But now, Joyce Tapaquan has come full circle. She doesn't drink anymore and is trying hard to break the cycle of addictions and abuse in her own family. This morning, did you make it on time? Yeah. Really? You did the bell ring or was you, were you on time? Yeah. Like their grandparents and their mother, Joyce's own children struggle with addictions. So this 51-year-old blind grandmother is raising her grandchildren on her own. She gives them everything that was taken from her when she was a young girl. A loving family, a safe home, and roots. Protecting her grandchildren and now helping her community heal from years of abuse. Joyce Tapaquan recently became a certified addictions counselor, the first person to go through the program blind. I work in addictions, you know, um, alcohol and drugs. and Today I do a lot of things to help people and so for myself a lot of these things that I talk about kept me back kept me from going anywhere in my life if you don't talk about it if you're just gonna shut those closets and not talk about your childhood or your adolescence they'll eventually get to you the past had a strong grip on Joyce but it doesn't anymore I forgive today I'm at that stage where now after this is to pack it all up, what happened, and then just take it and throw it the farthest I can and leave it there. Joyce is a witness to the fact that when you patiently and persistently chew away at something, good things can happen. But it takes time, and it takes a, a, a supportive community to do that. I really wanted help. I really wanted help. I didn't like Joyce at all. I was angry with Joyce. I was blaming Joyce for everything. How come you can't do it right, Joyce, when you're in a relationship? Why do you bugger these things up for yourself? I was so confused and so tormented from my childhood. But once I got going, I'm going to continue to move on here. I'm moving forward every day. Sure, I was stuck at times, but I kept on moving, moving. I deal with the issue. It was a day-by-day -day thing. Oh, I was happy to see the sun and the sunlight from the windows or feel the, my God, I woke up again. Whew, it's another day. Joyce Tapaquan is currently uniting with other victims of residential schools in a class action lawsuit against the government and churches who ran them. But for a woman who has come so far, this trial is not about winning or losing. 
Joyce has already won. Ni win. Ni win. Na nan. Na nan. I couldn't care less about money. I couldn't care less about if I don't even get a penny from them. <laughs> you know what I care about? <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a brave, courageous Native woman and who feels good inside now. Sure, I'm crying today. Sure, I'm revisiting where I was. But you know what? I became strong. And I know what I am today. Joyce believes her life's journey has been a good one. She says she suffered abuse as a child to help save her grandchildren and to help others in her community work through their past. God's worked a miracle of reconciliation and forgiveness in Joyce's life. The grip of the past has been replaced by the strong grip of a loving God. If you have any questions or comments about today's program, or if you'd like to learn more about the God who's healing Joyce and can heal us, please stay tuned for a way to contact us. For all of us here at Primary Focus, I'm Cal Bramer. See you again next week. If you have any questions or comments about this week's program, we invite you to contact us here at Primary Focus. Call 1-877-77-FOCUS. That's 1-877-773-6287. Our email address is info at primaryfocus.tv or write to us at P.O. Box 557755, Chicago, Illinois, 60655. Please contact us today.